Hi, my name is Susan Wahlberg, and we're here at the University of Oregon to talk with Dr. Edward O oh about short-term memory and attention. Hi, Dr. O. Oh. Hello. Can you tell us a little bit about why we ought to be interested in short-term memory? I think one of the main points of interest is that it seems to be one of our core intellectual abilities. So, for example, the amount of information people can hold in short-term memory seems to predict things like fluid intelligence, IQ, that is, and scholastic achievement. So it seems to be an important part of most of our kinds of higher level cognitive processes. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit more about the evolution of models with short-term memory? Well, on the topic of capacity in memory, one of the most famous uh, ideas about short-term memory capacity came from the paper of George Miller, where he mentioned the coincidence that the number 7 plus or minus 2 seemed to pop up in many different experimental paradigms where they were trying to measure the apparent capacity that people had for different types of information in different contexts. Uh, so this certainly captured many people's imagination. Um, however, I guess it seems like in more recent times that people have begun to rely on different kinds of measures of capacity. And part of the idea is that what we're trying to tap into with measures of short-term memory capacity is literally an idea of what information can be maintained at one moment in a person's mind. Uh, what are the active ideas in their mind? So, for example, one common task that's been used to measure memory capacity is the so-called digit span task, where people are read a list of randomly ordered numbers and then asked to repeat them back accurately. And the question is, how many of these numbers can they repeat back accurately? And that's where the number 7 plus or minus 2 came from. One possible problem, though, with this measure is that the number of items that people can report back in this situation probably go beyond the number of items they can actually hold in mind in one moment. Part of the reason is that people are very sophisticated with numbers. They're able to group them into chunks of more than one number. They're able to translate them into a speech code, which is not necessarily directly related to the number of items that they have in mind. So we believe that digit span is probably uh, determined by a combination of their short-term memory capacity, as well as other kinds of strategies and um, uh, tricks that people can use to report back digits. So you mentioned different ways of measuring capacity, um, and you specifically mentioned uh, digit memory. And how do the newer um, measure, measuring methods, I guess, how do they differ from that? And how, how does that end up with different measures of capacity? Well, many of the new methods of measuring capacity, which may be less susceptible to some of these additional memory tricks that we were talking about, the stimuli from these methods are designed so that it's difficult to summarize them. They don't have a lot of meaningful content so that people can't rely on their past long-term memories of those stimuli to be able to hold them in mind. So for example, one very popular task in the literature was introduced about 10 years ago by Steve Luck and Ed Vogel, where people simply see an array of colored squares for uh, a very brief period of time. And then one second later, a second array of squares comes up. And they simply indicate whether one of the squares has changed color or not. Uh, this task doesn't really leave much time for people to become, uh, to create meaningful memory uh, tricks to remember the colors. They're not able to summarize the uh, information in any other kind of format. And so maybe a more true measure of how many things they can hold in mind for that short period of time. And here, instead of the number 7 plus or minus 2, we tend to get an average capacity estimate of more around four items. And uh, one interesting fact is that this number 4 tends to come up in a wide variety of paradigms that have these properties. That is, memory paradigms where people can't rely on their past knowledge or other kinds of grouping tricks for remembering information. Um, and also, other paradigms such as multiple object tracking, where they're trying to see how many items a person can pay attention to in front of them for a very brief period of time. Here again, we see capacity estimates that are around the four item range. And we are starting to believe that this number may actually be a fairly truthful estimate of how many indiv 
individual items can be held in mind at one time. So with the digit measure, you mentioned chunking, um, where you lump, lump uh, letter numbers excuse me, together. So would you say then that most people could probably hold four chunks at a time, or just on average? Yes, uh, this idea that capacity, how many things can you remember, the idea that it is actually a measure of the number of chunks or meaningful units has been explicitly proposed. Uh, Nelson Cowan has a beautiful paper in which he outlines the idea that through use of chunking strategies and other things, people can indeed remember more information, but that careful studies suggest that the number of independent units or chunks that they can maintain holds constant at four. So one interesting example is that if you become an expert in a particular domain, then you will have better performance in tests of memory for that particular domain. For example, chess experts can remember many more chess uh, positions than novices in that game of chess. But it seems that the way they do that is by using their vast knowledge of chess positions and meaningful chess um, configurations on the board so that they can summarize the board into a much smaller number of chunks. And apparently when they attempt to estimate the number of chunks that these experts are holding, it turns out once again to be somewhere in that range of four items. So you mentioned that four is kind of the magic number. Is that consistent for everyone or is there more variation there like with Miller's seven plus or minus um, estimate? Yes, it, it turns out there are lots of individual differences in this particular ability. And you'll find a full range of scores if you test a large population of participants. Then you'll find some with capacities that seem to be in the range of five, six, even more items, whereas others may have difficulty performing well with more than one or two items. And this variation, importantly, seems to be meaningful. That is, variation in this measure does predict other kinds of mental abilities, such as the efficiency of attentional control, uh, their performance in school, and their performance on tests of fluid intelligence, such as IQ tests. So assuming that people have a, a set capacity and it can vary between, let's say, three and five for most people, um, even if you can only remember three things, can you remember three simple things and three complicated things at the same um, level of efficiency, or do you end up uh, with more complicated objects seeing a reduction in your ability to remember them? Right, it's a good question. That is, does it really matter what you're remembering, or is it always three, no matter what the information is? And this has been an important debate in the literature, the, the basic question of, whether one uses up more of their memory resources to remember complicated things than to remember simple things. And what, is that, what are the implications of that for our measurements of memory capacity? Um, does it make sense to talk about four things if we're not including information about what kind of things those four things are? And indeed, there have been studies that have suggested that performance on these kinds of memory tests uh, it does get worse when people have to remember more complicated items. So, for example, if you look at, if you present people with relatively simple items, like the simple colored squares, uh, then you'll find a capacity of around four. However, if you present instead uh, faces in that kind of task, a much more complicated stimulus, because you've got all these different facial features within each of these items, then what you'll find is that performance on that memory task gets much worse. Their accuracy goes down. Um, one key question then is, does their accuracy get worse because they're remembering fewer faces? Or is there some other way to explain that kind of decline in their performance on that task? So um, we have looked at those kinds of experiments and we have a hypothesis that actually it doesn't matter how complicated the items are. No matter how complex the items are, our study suggests that you can remember about four of them no matter what. But one key thing to keep in mind is that memory is imperfect. So 
if you have an item in memory, then it doesn't mean that you have a perfectly veridical copy of that item. It'll be a little bit blurry, like a camera picture where the camera moved just a little bit. Mm -hmm. And so once we begin to measure the clarity of those memories, then we can start to understand why it is that performance gets worse with more complicated or complex items. So what you're saying is, say your capacity is four objects, um, but what you can remember four things regardless of how complicated they are, but when they become more complicated, your resolution, your memory resolution of those objects is decreased? Yes, okay. that is the total proportion of information that you might remember about a complex item is indeed going to be less than the amount or the proportion of information that you can remember about a simple item. But the interesting point is that still, nevertheless, the same number of items are remembered, whether they're complicated or simple. So we've spoken about the individual differences between capacity, so some people can remember more and some people can remember less. Um, but I'd like to go into if some people can remember more sharply than others, so that you know your capacity of four is not necessarily hurt as much by complex objects if you have a clearer representation of them. There are stable individual differences in terms of the resolution or the clarity of the memories people can hold. And one uh, very interesting finding that we stumbled across in our research was when we examined the relationship between the number of things that a person can hold in memory and the clarity of those representations. What we found, to our surprise, was that these two scores, or these two abilities that we measured, were completely uncorrelated across subjects. So what I'm saying is that if you're an individual who can remember far more items than a typical person, that is a very large number of items, you may not necessarily also be an individual who has very clear memories of those items. That is, we can't predict the clarity of a person's memories just by knowing how many things that they can hold. So is there any relationship between how clear your memory is and other things like fluid intelligence? Right, so we had mentioned that fluid intelligence does seem to be reliably predicted by memory capacity. And so one basic question that raises is, which aspect of memory capacity is related to fluid intelligence? Is it the number of things that people can remember, or is it the clarity of their memories? And you can kind of see why it would be plausible that both of those would be important for performance in a fluid intelligence task, for example. Um, these kinds of IQ tasks usually require people to be sensitive to variations in the details across objects. But what we found in our recent research is that although the number of items a person can hold in memory is relatively strongly related to their fluid intelligence, there's actually no relationship in our studies between the clarity of a person's memory and their IQ. It's as though the link between IQ and working memory capacity is determined solely by how many things they can think about at once instead of by the precision of those representations in memory. So you mentioned that tests of fluid intelligence, um, the higher scores kind of go along with people who can remember more objects. Do you think that they're testing more how many objects you can hold in mind as opposed to how clear those objects are? That is, is there kind of a bias, Testing bias in right. what fluid intelligence tests seem to tap into? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a good question. I think in general, people worry about whether fluid intelligence tests may be restricted towards certain aspects of our intellectual capacities. And there will be many people that argue that standard measures of IQ, for example, are rather narrow measures of intellectual ability. Um, my guess is that the reason for this strong relationship is that indeed fluid intelligence tests these days uh, tend to be uh, biased towards measures of the number of interrelationships between things that people are able to consider simultaneously. And I think most people would agree that this is indeed an, a very important ability in a number of different contexts, whether it be problem solving or mathematical reasoning or other things like that. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't v other very important intellectual skills that may not be tapped by these IQ tests. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, what is the advantage then of having very clear memories as opposed to having copious memories? Yes, well, you know, 
think about various situations in which people need to make very fine discriminations between one item and another. Um, for example, a radiologist who is trying to determine the difference between a tumor and a normal piece of tissue or a bird collector or a bird watcher who's interested in seeing the difference between two species of birds. Well, in each of these cases, the clarity of their knowledge and their ability to discriminate fine differences will turn out to be crucial for their ability to carry out those tasks. And I imagine that, therefore, clarity within working memory is going to play a role in those kinds of procedures as well. Thanks, Ed. I learned a lot about the issue of short-term memory capacity.